Hello, my name is Alek Tarkovsky. I head a Polish NGO called Centrum Cyfrowe, which deals with all matters of open access and also um, issues such as open education and open glam or open heritage. So um, I have a kind of a broad approach to these issues and that's what I would like to talk about, about placing open access in a broader context of open policies because I should mention that policies of, are of particular interest to me. Um, I also am one of the public leads of Creative Commons Poland and I advise the Global Creative Commons as a policy advisor on uh, open policies in Europe. Um, I'd like to start by saying that the borders between um, different open content are vague. Uh, this is a very bad reproduction of a very nice digital scan of a painting called the Skolmeister from the Rieks Museum, so it's obviously an item of digital open uh, shared heritage, but also you can use it in art history classes and it becomes an educational material and probably art historians consider it a form of um, broadly understood open science. Um, this is of course just an anecdote, but I think we can find a lot more examples of that and I'd like to suggest that we are solely able to speak not just about open access, open science, open education, but open all. Open everything would probably be more grammatical, but this I think sounds nicer. This doesn't mean everything has to be open. It's not the way Wikipedia says access to all knowledge, but rather an understanding that the openness that we advocate for in different sectors of life somehow relate to each other and maybe we can either look for shared standards or at least um, very well define what are the differences and rationally understand them. By open, just to be clear, and I think this cuts across all sectors, I understand both access to content and user rights, understood very generally. And the key argument is that these rights are different in different aspects of open. And I would say that when you look at open all, everyone has a different sort of point of entry. If you're a programmer and you're used to free and open software, you have a bit of a different approach than if you're a scientist that has a very good background in open access models that, for instance, for a long time didn't consider licensing issues, which for floss programmers are just something completely and utterly obvious and necessary. Um, that's one distinction. The other important one and sort of uh, axis on which I would differentiate projects is the um, importance of access versus reuse. I think there are areas where reuse is not so important. I would say this is, of course, again, kind of um, not objective but subjective. And people can argue, but I would say reuse is more important for teachers who want to really create their own content than for a scientist who's often content with just reading a text, unless you're a um, text and data miner, but that's a different story. So just to list these areas, these are free and open software, open access, and more broadly speaking, open science, open education, open data, which usually means not research data, but public data, and open glam, or um, open cultural sector institutions. And I would say that we can see a gradual extension of this model into different spheres of activity. It's hard to say which one area is key, one cannot, I think, say which one is more important. And an interesting question whether there's some sort of open convergence. Um, I'll come back to that, that I think it's slowly happening um, in Europe. Um, another, I think, important thing to take into account, in my at least opinion, most of these open developments start with grassroots initiatives in open access. It's just scientists taking things into their own hand. In education, you had teachers sharing materials earlier than school systems started doing it. Uh, when you look at public sector information, it's a bit different for kind of obvious reasons because it's the institutions themselves that hold um, the content. But having said that, I think it's crucial to move from just grassroots to top-down policies. This might be obvious to some of you if you look at things like mandates, which is, again, more or less top-down. So it, of course, takes into account the autonomy of institutions, <coughs> but it's a top-down policy. And why are they important? Because I think they give a strong leverage for openness, and this was shown very well by the data about how your um, deposition rates raise uh, when you have mandates. Um, and the strong argument here is that these policies often uh, address public funding. I think if we're dealing with public funding, our arguments are a lot stronger. But the one sort of fault is that when you talk about policies, when you talk about mandates and necessity, you sort of lack the personal voluntary decision, which I think is very important. <coughs> Openness becomes an issue of one more institutional policy. You have a policy that you need, I don't know, to stamp the top of your envelope, and you have a policy that you need to send it somewhere. It's very different if you feel it's your sort of activism. But I guess that's sort of the price we're paying. 
And I think it's important to look at open access as a point of reference. I'll maybe skip going through this because I realize this is obvious to you and I don't need to explain to you the history of open access, but it suffices to say that it's a very long history and this model is a lot more developed than, for example, open educational resources. I think we're seeing now, these are for me the two crucial issues because open educational resources are relatively newcomer to this area. 2008, the Cape Town Declaration, first attempts to sort of define the field. Um, but, but today, at, at least at the level of higher education, I think it, it's, you know, you kind of have to look at them both. You can make a conscious decision to focus just on open access. It's a lot harder for institutions just to work with open educational resources, but I think it's best it, it is to kind of think about them together and some important things to take into account that I think the model is a lot less developed. No one can explain the way they can do for open access. There's this path or this path. The basic tool is a repository and there's a clear licensing model or there shouldn't be licensing. I think the debate on licensing is ongoing. The tools are still not clear. The educational models around resources are unclear. For instance, thing maybe you heard about the flipped classroom. Some say it's great, some say um, it isn't. What this all leads to, I think if we try to think about open all that may be an interesting thing to do, and this is kind of a side thought, would be to try to describe these different areas on a template. The template for me would include generally understood repositories, so technical tools, how you deal with metadata, how do you enforce compliance or support compliance, what are the licensing standards, and what are existing use, reuse practices. And you can put on this template science, education, glam, and so on. And I think this work would, would kind of allow us to think about this convergence I talked about. Um, moving on, I just wanted to very briefly mention, in my opinion, law is important. I, I respect the argument that we're still not done with the basic issue of access that's at heart of open access, but I think we cannot ignore the licensing debate. Um, and again, this is an area where open education maybe differs from open access, but I think it should also kind of um, inspire open access activists because we're starting to see re that reuse is important and to ensure reuse you need licensing or you need a copyright reform that would say that reuse falls outside of copyright. I would argue the latter is a lot harder. Um, and. Um, I don't want to um, focus on that too much, maybe that's enough, it's probably a subject for a whole seminar. Moving on, I wanted to very briefly describe the situation in Poland. Uh, we have a conference in Poland, I feel we're not talking a lot about Poland, so I hope this is also useful for those of you who are from abroad. Um, I think it's another reason why I like to look both at open access and open education, is that a lot more is happening in the open educational sphere, I would argue although it's ma mainly happening at the K-12, the um, schooling system level. Um, and um, uh, we have now a very big project to create open textbooks. Um, I won't go into details, you can find them online, but there's nothing of such scale and similarity at the um, sort of scientific level. I'll skip that if you excuse me. Um, and um, because I can see I'm running out of time, but I would like to say that, um, so for example, in Poland, for me, kind of the scenario is flipped, although we, there's knowledge about open access, obviously, and the open access initiatives were there a lot earlier than open education. In terms of results, and I, again, I, I, uh, I know this is subjective and I don't want to offend any open access activists, but I think we're not yet replicating in science the big sort of success of an open textbook system, because for that, for instance, we'd need an open access strategy, which Poland lacks. And just some final remarks very quickly. One thing that I just want to raise the issue, because I know this is not at all discussed in open access circles, is that I think we should go just beyond the debate on open licenses and think whether scientists shouldn't be involved in the copyright debate. I think this is something that simply cannot be avoided because this debate is knocking to our doors. And I don't have time to go into details, but the text and data mining debate is a very key issue. Just recently, for example, Sevier published a new license agreement where they use Creative Commons licensing as an attempt to build what they consider a beneficial structure for reuse of their content for text and data mining. 
And as Creative Commons, we believe in that's not just our Polish opinion, it's completely wrong. You cannot use a non-commercial license, uh, enforce it on your subscribers and suggest this is a valid model to make content available for data mining. There's just one example that seems to be most um, fresh. And the last argument I wanted to make um, concerns uh, what's happening in Europe. I think this is not an issue of some philosophy that throws all these areas together, but we're really seeing how it goes just beyond open access. There are very strong requirements in Horizon 2020, but for instance, if you look at the educational sphere, the new opening up education has some open provisions in the Erasmus Plus program. Um, in the sphere of open data, the reuse directive creates really strong um, model for openness. And the big issue is how the copyright directive will shape exceptions and limitations, whether they will provide an open model that will support these voluntary models um, or not. And I believe we're slowly starting to see that, that these spheres kind of influence each other, that uh, people from the educational sector and the DG uh, draw inspiration from the work done in Horizon 2020. So hopefully we'll move even to further sort of um, uh, building of convergence between these areas where again I hope open access will play a key role. Thank you very much.